so much for that song. I want to say a couple things about that song. First of all, I want to say to all the boys and girls, keep taking your music lessons. And uh, I was listening to some of our grandchildren playing the piano and things at Christmas, and uh, they're already way past where I was. I just, I never got past uh, up and down the block or whatever that first song was, you know. And uh, so, boys and girls, uh, stay with your lessons. And secondly, uh, I think about that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You know, a lot of younger people, millennials in particular, they like newer songs. And I liked newer songs when I was younger. I understand some of that. And, uh, and there's a place for some of those. But let me tell you about a song like that, that for, for folks my age and a little older, that song ministered to us tonight in a very special way. And all of us need to appreciate a song like, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So uh, it's a blessing, and I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful that we can have this time together tonight. Well, would you take your Bibles and turn to the book of First John tonight for a time of preaching around the Word of God? And let's stand together and turn to First John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and if you would turn there, we're going to look at beginning in just a moment here uh, in verse number 15. We left off last week in verse number 14. We're going to look at verses 15, 16, and 17. We'll have one more song, and then we'll uh, get right into this Bible study. This is a serious type of Bible study uh, tonight. It's, it's very helpful. I, I learn, I've read these verses at least a hundred times, probably many more. But I learned some things that I want to share with you tonight, and uh, I hope that it'll be a blessing to you as, as it has been to me. So John chapter 2 and verse number 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So now we're going to learn about priorities. We're going to learn about where to set our love. And how many of you want to keep your priorities right till Jesus comes? And, and uh, that, that must be done with intentionality. So we're going to learn how to do that tonight. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege, again, to open your word. And Father, in the early weeks of this year, we're trying to set some direction that will help us to have the right priorities. And we learned this morning about the priority of declaring the gospel. But Lord, we'll not do that unless we love you. And so help us to continue to get deep with you tonight and then to bear fruit in the days ahead is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So 
question Any doubt that you love me Was settled at the cross Every word was mercy Every breath forgave Every drop of blood Testifies of grace speak another word of blessing and the silence leaves me with a sense of loss I'll remember when my heart begins to question any doubt that you love me was settled at the cross any doubt that you love me was settled at the cross. At the cross. Thank you, ladies. Well, last week we learned in First John chapter two a biblical description of the church. And we learn that in the church, there are all of us who are referred to as children of God. And sometimes that word children refers to a spiritual level. And then we learn that there are young men who grow in their strength and faith. And then we learn that there are fathers. And that term fathers was indicative of mature believers who can train other believers. And that should be our desire that we can be that second Timothy 2, 2 believer who can train others also. Well, tonight we're going to turn our attention from focusing on the church to seeing God's view of the world. And by the way, the church and the world should always stand in contrast. It's a tragic thing when the church is so much like the world that an unbeliever would not even know why he would need to get saved. And so in these verses we see the church as a growing spiritual entity. And then we're going to see what God says about the world tonight. And as we open up the Word of God, we see that in this passage, the world will always be tempting the church and individual Christians to draw them away. Temptation to love the world is always strong despite the fact that this world is not our home. I remember talking with Brother Sisk a few years ago and just about the fact that even as he was contemplating in his 80s, he was saying how we uh, oftentimes, maybe subconsciously, attempt to hold on to things and we place emphasis on things and, and possessions and experiences. A and he said, I, I need to pray to realize that soon I will be with Jesus Christ and these things will not really matter. And yet, many times we are programmed, whether we will admit it or not, to live for the world more than we really should. And so, what I want us to learn tonight in this passage is that we are to love the people of this world, but not the mechanisms, the systems, and the philosophies of this world. People must be loved, but the dominions and powers of this world must not be loved. Uh, you can enjoy sports, but you can also love the people that play sports to Christ, but you should not love sports more than you love God, right? So God gives us, the Bible says, all things to enjoy. He wants us to enjoy the planet that he created, but he does not want us to love this planet, as many do, they worship it, more than we love him. Uh, there are secular places that uh, are, are places of beauty, and I, I admire 
beautiful architecture and, and, and even sometimes cathedrals and churches that long ago have stopped preaching the gospel. Sometimes it's just beautiful to see the architecture. But, but I do not love those places. I want to have a love for people who maybe are wrongly following after false doctrine. But we do not place our love after architecture, after systems, after uh, sports. Uh, I think of politics. And I want to have a burden for people that maybe have various political persuasions or maybe are involved in politics. And I want to have a love for them and a compassion for them. But I do not want to have a love for politics that is greater than my love for God. And I think some Christians got off base there the last few months. I think all of these issues became uh, overwhelming in their heart to the point of anxiety. And in some cases, if they were Christians, to the point of foolish acting. You see, God doesn't want us to be so uh, emotionally involved in loving uh, this world's systems. And so uh, I, want to, uh, I, I want to love the people at work, but not necessarily love my work more than the work of God. Now, the word world is used 292 times in the New Testament. And we are told often that we should love people, uh, love one another, uh, and uh, that this love comes from God. But here we are told not to love the systems that people have created or the world, uh, as we'll see it defined in just a moment. John 1.10 says of Jesus, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Luke 9, 25. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Uh, what does it profit a man, it says in another gospel, if he gain the whole world and lose himself? And really, it is tragic, and we see it very easily in the secular sense of people such as Howard Hughes or uh, maybe today Bill Gates who have amassed incredible amounts of wealth, but they deny the efficacy of what the young lady saying about a moment ago, the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so it is tragic when someone loves the world and they, they are successful in the world, but they never knew God. And so let's notice in verse 15, as we begin tonight, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Here we have a command regarding love. And I think during this COVID, when we have been uh, sequestered and you know, when we've been having to quarantine and all this type of thing, it's been easier for some to maybe watch a lot more television, get involved in a lot more social media, pick up some hobbies here and there. Again, not necessarily bad. Uh, but when the affection of our life goes to these things, it becomes a dangerous trap. And we're going to see that tonight. There's a command regarding love, love, where I put my affections, what I give myself to uh, is to be for the Lord. Now, this is a negative command in verse 15. It says, love not the world. Now, the word world, we, you perhaps have studied before, cosmos, it, it means uh, the, the, the sense of the world's systems. Uh, it's from which the word cosmopolitan comes, uh, as well as the word cosmetics. I'm not going to preach against makeup tonight, ladies. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, the word cosmos speaks of the world's system. The Bible says, love not. Uh, we see that the world is opposed to God. And we'll define that more in just a moment. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the term, he's a very worldly man. It's a tragic thing. It should be really an oxymoron when someone says a worldly Christian. But sometimes that can be a description of Christians as well. Jerry Vines, who was the longtime pastor of the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida, wrote, he wrote a wonderful commentary on 1 John. It was probably the first commentary I ever read when I began pastoring here uh, 35 years ago, uh, his commentary on 1 John. And he said, worldliness is one of the problems of the modern church. It plagues our churches and keeps them from having the power of God. It robs us of our spiritual effectiveness. It ruins our witness for the Lord. Now, I, I did not plan months and months ago to preach this exact message tonight. I planned to be preaching through 1 John. But as God has ordered this, I am preaching against 
worldliness on the Sunday night before the revival meeting, how many of you think that might be a good thing? And I agree with Dr. Vines who says it is a problem of the modern church. It plagues our churches and it keeps us from having the power of God. Why? Because when God's people are loving the world's systems and the world's activities and the world's vices more than they're loving God, how then could we have revival if we have a misplaced love? And so this negative command is needed. He says, neither the things that are in the world. And there are several things that scripture tells us that are in the world that we should not love. There are many of these things that specifically attract uh, single adults, and sometimes young marrieds or teenagers or those who've been saved a long time. The Bible says, for example, in John 7 and verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. We have entire television stations and publishing houses and uh, writers in Hollywood whose minds are only continually worldly and evil, and they fight against the very purposes of God in this world. And so God says, don't love what they're putting out. Don't put your mind to what they're putting out. Uh, think of this, if you would. Turn to John 15, 19, as we think about the world's attitude towards Christ and Christianity. And folks, you're going to see a rise of this the next few years. You're going to see that there is a hatred. H how many of you understand that the men and women who broke into the Capitol building a few weeks ago and stole things are absolute criminals that need to be punished by the rule of law. Okay? But what I'm seeing is an attempt on the part of the media to say that every conservative American and Christian, that's their heart to do that type of thing, which of course is absolutely ludicrous. But the world would love to somehow stereotypically say that every Christian who has conservative values is a weirdo or a wacko. Uh, and, and, and I believe that Christians are going to be uh, facing censorship. I believe that they're going to feel the results of the cancel culture that's happening in America today. And I'm not a doomsdayer. But you say, Pastor, why do you think that's going to happen? Let me show you why. John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, what does it say? Now, how many of you are thankful when you run across a believer out in the society that kind of has a kind spirit as a Christian? You know what I'm talking about? And yes, there are still kind people in the world who, uh, they're not venomous. But God says that this world system is against Jesus Christ. It is anti-Christ. And there, there is at the root of those who live uh, lives of continual habitual sin, not only a hatred for conservatives, but deeper than that, it is a hatred for Christ. And Jesus taught us, if the world hates me, then the world will hate you. And how can we say that we are Christ followers? How can we determine to follow Christ in this new year and then be offended and want to quit the Christian life because some unsafe person doesn't treat us right? It's probably better that we put our big boy pants on tonight spiritually and recognize that if we intend to live for Jesus, there will be people in this world that do not appreciate your testimony and your faith. This is what Jesus said. He's trying to help us to realize we're playing the fool when we love this world systems because it doesn't love us. Uh, Satan, in fact, is the god of this world's systems, right? Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, In whom the god of this world, that would be Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Have you ever witnessed somebody like that? It's just like 
they, they, they can't hardly see it. They've had so many secular classes. They've had so many people tell them that religion's a farce and that all roads lead to the same place. Whatever philosophy, their minds blinded. And it says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But notice the first part of that verse. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan is the God of this world. Now, folks, let me just share an illustration, and this is a little bit drastic, but bear with me for just a moment. First, you probably could not have a more patriotic pastor than the one you have right now. I love America. I read about our founders. I read biographies every summer. I believe God's hand was on George Washington. I don't believe he was perfect, but I believe God used him. I believe that about John Adams. I believe that about Daniel Webster and so many others of our founders. I love that I live in a Christian nation. Perfect? No. But I love that I live in a Christian nation. And I love the men and women in this room who served our country in the military. And I love our flag. And I, I, I am greatly troubled when people desecrate our flag. You're not going to find a pastor uh, who's more uh, pro-America, pro-defense, however you want to describe it. I thank God for the red, white, and blue. And I don't care if that becomes politically incorrect. We're going to teach that at Lancaster Baptist School as long as I'm the pastor here. And we will not tolerate disrespect for our country. And I with all of our flaws as a country, I still love America. But let me illustrate something for you. I love my Lord more than I love this country. And my loyalty is to my Lord more than it is to this country, to our flag, to the Republican Party, or whatever entity you want to name. Because friends, all of these ultimately, I don't even find America in prophecy. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to America, frankly, by the time Jesus comes again. We know that there will be a falling away. How many of you have read that in the Bible? We know there's a coming of an Antichrist. I believe there's a coming uh, uh, world empire. Revelation 17. I believe this with all my heart. There will be an Antichrist. I don't know what's going to, I don't know if it's China. I don't know what's going to happen to America. Uh, maybe a coronavirus time 10. I have no idea. I just know this. This country, before Jesus returns, in the vast sense of the majority of these things in the world system, will likely turn away from its biblical heritage. And we better be dialed in tonight as to where our loyalties lie. And they had better lie at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. I was speaking to a friend last night who called me in. And we were talking about the fact that in the next few years, every Christian will come to a bridge. That was the term he used. And he was referring to this bridge as a bridge of identity with Christ. And ident he says our teenagers, our single adults, they're going to come to a place where they're going to have to decide, will they identify with Christ or will they co compromise and in pragmatism just kind of identify with the world so they won't have to stand out on that bridge? And we all must make this decision in our minds. Will we love the world or will we love Christ? We are seeing now this cancel culture. And I believe that idea of, of, of having uh, social media canceled or having support canceled or, or uh, perhaps someday corporations requiring uh, men and women to sign certain dogma that you will not say this or you will not believe that if you want to keep your job. I hope that doesn't come. I hope it doesn't come. But how many of you understand the vast majority of corporate America, the systems of this world, is anti-Christ? How many of you understand that? And so God says, and how many of you are thankful that the Bible's pretty, pretty plain on these matters, don't fall in love with the world that you're living in. Because the world is not your friend. Don't be duped in that area. It's a, it's a negative command, yes, but it's, it's a very important command. Notice, secondly, there's a negative result with this command in verse number 15. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, here uh, we understand the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, then, are inherently incompatible. 
The two are mutually exclusive and opposed to one another. They are antithetical and cannot peacefully coexist. That's why the most unhappy Christian you will ever meet is a worldly Christian. Because God did not design the Christian life to be lived both ways. He designed the Christian life to be one when we are completely sold out to Jesus Christ. True Christians, therefore, will not be characterized by habitual love for the world, nor will worldly people demonstrate really a genuine love for God. And so God is saying, I want you to understand that you cannot say that you love me and be filled up with a love for the world at the same time. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. You don't need to turn there. Perhaps you've read it before. No man can serve what? Two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let me, let me just say, there are times when some of you guys in the military and stuff, you've got duty and sometimes there's overtime and sometimes, you know, you're a shift worker and you're the new guy at the job. You got to work some Sundays. But I'm going to just go out on a limb here and just say, I don't believe that God's people should voluntarily work overtime on Sunday because you want to make a little extra money. I recommend that you give God his day. You cannot serve God and mammon. And it's very difficult to be out of church and out of church and out of church and to really keep a warm heart for God. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Let's turn there, if you would please, holding your place, of course, in 1 John. But James chapter 4 and verse 4. Now this is some plain language, but the, the church today, this church, needs plain language. And the Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, God said, if you want to be a worldly Christian that is in love with the systems of this world and, and the, uh, the activities of this world, the values of this world, God, not me, God calls it spiritual adultery. And I, I, I'm watching a lot of my peers, my age group, and in the church and outside of the church. And so many decisions these days are being made on the basis of money. And we get caught up into the ideas of the accountants and caught up in that, whoa, I'll time my house and sell it here. That way I can do this. And I'll do this. And I'll do that. And here, today I'll go here. And tomorrow I'll go there and get gain. And you know what James says about that? We need to stop and say, if God wills, I will do this or that. Some of you need to get God back into your picture and stop living on your emotions, living on the world's uh, ideas of, of finance and, and uh, ideas of success. And this is what James says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, one author said it this way, worldliness is a state of mind. And that sometimes is true. And again, you'll meet a Christian and all they're talking about is uh, this system or that system or this political party or that or this investment tool or this uh, group that they're going to join. And, and the entire conversation is about the world. And what we're trying to emphasize early on this year is let's get back to the Bible. Let's get back to the gospel. Let's get back to remembering our God. There is a command regarding love, and the command is very clear. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we are not to love this world. Now, you work in the world, yes. You invest in the world, fine. But those investments are not to get more of the world. Those are to get more people to heaven. Can I get an amen on that? You see, uh, it's not wrong to be in the world. It's wrong to be of this world and to live for the things of this world. Hey, I'm not saying that you it's a sin to know the score of a ball game when you go to work tomorrow. I'm just simply saying that there ought to be something to your life much more defining than just those kinds of things. And that is God. The command to love him. You know, I was thinking about this song they were playing a minute ago. What a friend we have in Jesus. Is he your friend? Do you talk to him? Do you listen to him? Do you love God? That's really the essence of the Christian life. Notice, secondly, the consideration of temptation. Notice verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. Now here we begin to see 
how seductive the world is. Remember, who's the father of this world? Someone help me. Satan is the God of this world, the father of this world. And his desire is to draw men away from a love for God. Satan doesn't want you young fathers to raise godly children. He doesn't want us to have a testimony for God. And so he is going to draw us away. And I want you to consider the, the seduction that is mentioned here. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now we're going to look at that in just a moment. But each of these are seductive lures to draw us away from God and into that world. Now my granddad, his name was Paul Bryan Chapel, And back when I was a little younger, I thought he was the strongest man in the whole wide world. I remember trying to, trying to screw a, a, a Phillips screw into a, into a two by six stud in his garage. And I was stripping that screw. And I mean, I could barely get that thing turned. And my granddad, uh, he came in and he, he grabbed that for me and said, oh, let me have that thing. He was a very direct person. That's where I got my timidity was from my grandfather. <laughs> and boy, he took that thing and three turns later, that thing plowed right into that wood. He was a strong man and he worked hard. He drove those tractors, you know, 16, 20 hours a day, and, and, uh, and, and he, he just was very, very disciplined. Farmers are very, very disciplined people. But there's one thing he'd love to do that it was just enjoyment to him, and he thought about it all summer long when he was on those tractors, and back then, those tractors, I think the last tractor he drove was a 4020, which those did not have cabs. They did not have GPS navigation. They did not have stereos. They did not have air conditioning. It was just the old farmer out in the sun. And so he would think about going fishing. And my granddad loved to fish. And he was a master fisherman. Uh, how many of you in here have ever uh, done much fly fishing? Anybody in here do some fly fishing? Fly fishing's an art. And my grandfather would know exactly which uh, flies or insects that they would make would go into which river and at what time of the year. And, and uh, fly fishing requires a, a, a science, if you will, of casting. And, and, and then sometimes we'd get in his boat and we'd go out on the McPhee Reservoir outside of Cortez, Colorado, and, and we would troll uh, for trout or bass. And <laughs> Brother Houck did that with me one time. And uh, you can ask him after church. We both got in bad trouble that day. Remember that, Brother Houck? We kept getting our lines crossed over and we got the giggles about it. You do not get the giggles with my granddad when you're fishing in the back of his boat. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> he took it very seriously. But he used different lures to catch different fish. Uh, one of the lures uh, was called a plug lure, and it would turn just a certain way and attract, I believe, the bass. And then there was the flash trap spinner lure, and that one was good for the trout. Then there was the zigzag lure. And uh, each of these lures was kind of designed to catch a different kind of fish. And Satan has different kinds of lures because not everyone here faces as the same temptations or desires, and Satan knows what lure to bring across. And let me tell you something, and those of you at LBCLive.tv, Satan has had his lures in the lake during COVID-19. Oh yeah. Because he wants the church to be a worldly church. And so I want you to see the three lures of Satan tonight. First, there is the lust of the flesh. The word lust means desire, craving, longing. Again, Dr. Vines says of this, though the body itself is not sinful, we have a fallen nature that makes an improper appeal to natural desires of our body. The world wants to cause us to try to satisfy those normal desires in abnormal ways. The lust of the flesh can relate to many types of wrong fulfillment in the body's desire, especially sexual sin and moral excess. And I want you to turn to understand this to Galatians chapter 5. Because we live in, a, in an overly sexualized society. This is not the problem of some men. It is a problem for every man in this room. Because men are sight-oriented and the devil is trying to draw men constantly into a worldly thought pattern. And it's always amazed me how that sometimes the men that get more into that become angry and defensive 
and oftentimes are difficult to talk to and reason with because they are in love with the world system as it relates to the lust of the flesh. And there's a conviction or a guilt about it. And you don't understand sometimes why there's such an unfaithfulness and why there's such a touchiness. And, and oftentimes in, in my life of counseling and dealing with men, when you really get to the root of it, there's a root problem here. And it's the lust of the flesh. And it's manifesting in various attitudes toward their wife, toward church, etc., etc. And Galatians speaks of it. Verse, chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh... This is what we're talking about. The lure, the lust of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Fornication. Fornication is all sexual activity outside of marriage. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Strife seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. All of these are the world's appetites and activities of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as we've learned in 1 John, when it speaks of doing these things, it's speaking of those that are involved in unbroken uh, appetites of these nature, of these natures, those that are involved in these sins as a lifestyle are not saved people. They're not going to find themselves in heaven. That does not mean that a saved person uh, may not fall into temptation. If he does, there will be a repentance and a breaking of that habit. But God says people that live this way with their lifestyle, they're not even going to see heaven. You say, well, that's judgmental preaching. I mean, folks, I don't write it. I just recite it. You see, the worldly church thinks they can play with this. And we've seen recently, and, and you know, sometimes it's in independent Baptist churches. I've, I've stood right up before you and said, hey, here's how we deal with sin at Lancaster Baptist Church. And hey, sometimes it's not been dealt with in proper ways in other churches. And we've kept a clean record in that area. I don't write off a whole movement because of a few churches that didn't handle sin properly. Uh, it's interesting to me when it happens in the Baptist church, everyone wants to say, oh, look at the hypocrisy there. Well, I, I've seen churches just recently in Australia, Pentecostal churches and others, where this sin is rampant and there is a tolerance and they talk about being under grace while staff members are living in immorality and while choir members are uh, living in adultery and so on and so forth. And I just want to say, sin is sin. It doesn't matter where it's happening. It's the world. It's wrong. And we will never have revival if we we are tolerating this lust of the flesh and its outpourings in our lives or in our church. And I don't know of that in our church tonight, but I will tell you that if, if something manifests like that, that with a spirit of love and engagement and a heart for restoration, we're going to go to some individual and say, hey folks, this isn't right and it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be repented of and, and we need to have restoration of marriage or whatever the case may be. Why? Because God says you can't love the world. You can't live in that lifestyle and have fellowship with God at the same time. And I don't know about you. I'm not going to clear four nights of revival off for next week to hear preaching to just play a game. We must get serious with God next week. And you're not serious with God if you're involved in the lust of the flesh, however that may be manifesting itself in your life. And, and there may need to be some repenting that begins in the church before Brother Getz preaches his first message. And so there is the lust of the flesh. And you can read Galatians 5. It's one of the lures of the devil to get you to become a worldly Christian. Well, you know, it's all right because, and then the rationale begins. I mean, it, it, there's always a reason why that it's okay. But God's saying, no, it's not okay. You can't love me and do that at the same time. You can't have fellowship with me and be doing that at the same time. And I, I don't know how the mind gets so twisted. I don't, I don't know how that satanic, luring rationale works, but I've seen it firsthand. I, I've seen people live in a, incredible uh, aspects of Galatians 5, sin-wise, who have justified it because they're really under grace. Well, that kind of grace is a fake grace. 
Grace is not a license to live in the world. I, I remember a man looking me right in the eye as he was cheating on his wife and I was begging him to repent and his wife was getting counsel from my wife, begging him to get right, comforting her, hoping, and him telling me, I have never been closer to God than I am right now. And friends, nothing could be farther from the truth, but the devil pulls the blinds on people. Don't play in the devil's workshop. The lust of the flesh is a lure that has ruined many good lives and marriages. Then there's secondly, notice this one. It's called the lust of the eye. Now, the stimulus caused from what we see often affects our hearts and our thoughts. And here, the devil also appeals to the mind because much of what we think comes through the eye gate. We ought to be careful with what we watch from our eyes. I love the psalm that says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. And, and whether you need a filter or whether you have just a couple television stations, some people have no television. I don't care how you do it. Shared passcodes on your internet. It could be sexual temptation. It could be covetousness. And just seeing things and, and being programmed by the world that this will make you happy. This will make you successful. And it's a lure of the devil to get you chasing after something, thinking you'll find fulfillment or satisfaction in that relationship or in that possession. And all of it becomes idolatry. And an idol is anything that replaces God with your attention and your thoughts. Matthew 5.28, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. God says, look, you've got to guard the lust of your eyes and be vigilant in this area. I think of David in 2 Samuel 11 and 2. It came to pass in the evening tide that David arose up off his bed. All the other soldiers were out to war. David didn't go. He got up off his bed and he walked up to the roof of his house. And from the roof, the Bible says, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David inquired after the woman. And David took the woman. He looked. He gazed. He inquired. He took her as unto himself. And the man that was after God's own heart became a worldly man. And you read the rest of the story. The murder. The devastation of his family. The, the division of his family. The Absalom that rose up against him. And where did that all begin? It began when a lure came by. And he bit. And he got jerked in. And he lived the rest of the days of his life. Yes, restored with God. But having that blot on his life's testimony. The lust of the eyes. Can I just say, if, if someone gets something that you've always wanted, be happy for them and be careful that you don't get caught up into covetousness. I find if you're happy about it and thrilled about it, God may bless you with that very thing at some time, but don't get caught up with covetousness. The lust of the eyes. Then notice thirdly, the third lure is the pride of life. The pride of life. This comes into the life oftentimes of men as we get older. We think we know what we need to know. No one's going to talk to me like that. I've been around the block. I'm sure you've seen it in your secular workplaces. Men that are now 62, a new sergeant, he's 40, and he's a punk. And we know better. The pride of life. Through pride, humanity defies God and arrogantly attempts to dethrone the sovereign of the universe, meaning that when we're filled with pride, we think we know better than God knows. Because many times our complaints about work, our complaints about this life are really thinly veiled complaints at God. Can, can I just say this tonight? Nothing catches God by surprise, and I'm not saying God brought COVID, but God has allowed it. All of the fiery trials are Father filtered. How many believe that somehow, some way, God has a purpose in this? I do. And sometimes I've complained just like you, especially with the continuously changing uh, 
you know, rules and, and uh, quarantines and all of this inconvenience. But I've tried throughout these last nine months to find rest in the fact God is sovereign. He's in control. And he is. And I don't want to complain against God acting as though I know better than he does. We see in the scriptures times when men became full of themselves. I think of the Tower of Babel. It was a great example of men filled with pride. They were going to literally try to get to heaven on their own without God. Genesis 11.4. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name. Right? That's the pride of life. You can have it all and have it your way without God. That's the essence of the world's message. It's total fallacy. We know that. The United Nations will not bring peace and the World Health Order will not bring health and the politicians will not bring unity. Not for a second. But they say they can and they say they will and yet if we really are living right and Jesus is our king, we're not going to believe all that nonsense because we know that our hope is found in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4. Some of you might remember. The king spake and he said, listen to this word. He said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Just as fast as God gives you a promotion, just as fast as God blesses your life, he can take it away too. Because he gives us nothing so that we can glory in it ourselves. Every success, every blessing, every degree, every class, every raise, every opportunity, everything that you and I have received is a gift from God and God should be glorified with it. But somehow the pride of life, we begin to think, look what I did. Look at what I built. And there's great danger, and this can happen in the ministry as well. You can find your ego gratification in what you built. A Sunday school class, a bus route, the church. And then you come through COVID, and you, you, you find very quickly that, number one, it never was you. And number two, if you're thinking it's you, you were in a self-trap of deceit. You know what a time like this can be for so many of us? A very humbling time to come back to God and to say, God, without you, I can do nothing. Use me again. You see what I'm saying? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are the lures James chapter 1 and verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be, tempt, can, cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You've read that verse before. There is lust, the Bible says, when we are tempted. When lust conceives, it brings forth sin. That's when someone's acting upon the thought. And then sin brings death. What does it kill? It kills marriages. It kills relationships. It kills a good testimony. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help tonight when I preach this message. I know it's sober. I told you it's not necessarily a funny message, but it's an important message that we would listen to. And so there's the command of the apostle. And the command is love not the world. And there's the consideration of temptation. Even while God says, don't love the world, Satan's like, hey, try this one. You'll like this. Try this one. You'll like this. And, and he'll keep casting until Jesus calls us home. And that's why we come to church and study verses just like these. Notice finally tonight the conclusions of the scripture. Verse 17. And the world, what do the next two words say? Passeth away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, they say that Joe Biden had all these Chinese business relationships, made all this money. Maybe he did. I don't know. Donald Trump appears to be a fairly successful businessman and owns hotels and golf courses. But did you know it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat? 
I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. No one's taken it with them. And God is very clear in this passage. Verse 17. The world passeth away. The world is temporal. This present world, according to 2 Peter 3, one day will burn up. I don't want to disappoint the Jehovah Witnesses. This is not heaven. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen some beautiful places in this world. I'm, I'm telling you, I love the Rocky Mountains, and I've, I've seen some beautiful, beautiful places. I love the planet, the creation that God has created. But heaven is going to be so much better than this earth. You know? It, wouldn't it be a bummer if you were a Jehovah Witness and this was heaven and, and, and they all met in Boron for their annual heavenly meeting? <laughs> be a little depressing. <laughs> How many of you believe God's got this beat with his heavenly creation for us? But turn in your Bible to 2 Peter 3.10. Because, again, if we are in the idea of thinking that Attaining more and more and more is the idea of happiness and success, and it becomes our idol, then we are going to be very disappointed as God's people. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, I believe there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And what a great, great place this will be. But this planet and all that is on this planet is temporal. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Psalm 90 and verse 9. For all of our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. When I, when I think about being here for 35 years, and some of you have been here most of the time, and some of you that have been married a while, and so on and so forth, every one of us that are maybe just a little older, not, not too old, but just a little older, every one of us would say, it goes by so fast. And those of you that are you know, 30s and younger, you're like, oh, it can't go by fast enough for me. I'm having a good time. And, and those of you that are single and not married, you're like, okay, Jesus is coming, but I hope he waits till I get married. I know every stage of life I've actually lived through most of them, believe it or not. But the Bible says we spend our days as a tale that is told. It just goes by that quickly. James 4 and 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And sometimes as a pastor, you see that more vividly. You think about it more. The funeral this coming Saturday for a 62-year-old wonderful godly woman that God called home, Mrs. Collins. And when you walk through that with people, pray for Brother Robert Weaver, dear member of our church. Brother D and Robert, they're watching, I'm sure, right now, unless they're here somewhere diagnosed with very serious throat cancer. And I'm praying for his healing. And then as a pastor, I will always pray that God deliver someone and believe that he can and that he will. But Brother Robert's 81 and he's full of God's grace. I saw it on him yesterday as we prayed together. But I know that in his heart, he's thought, boy, this life has gone by fast. How silly then how silly to fall in love with something so temporal. The Bible teaches that in this world, we are going to see the world pass away. The will of God then is the only eternal thing. When you obey God's word, whether it's loving your family, loving your spouse, witnessing, serving, when you live for Jesus, those are the only eternal things. Notice what it says there as we close tonight in verse 17. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the what? Abideth how long? Well, what's the will of God? Well, I can tell you, first of all, the will of God is that you would be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. 
Doing the will of God would, would then mean that I receive his son that he sent for me. Some people say, I, I just have trouble finding the will of God. Well, it's God's will that you'd be saved. It's God's will that you would obey his word and keep his commandments. And, and as he reveals these to you, that you would follow those commandments, just doing his will. This person that lives this life is showing the fruit of salvation and will live forever because of his salvation. Though our outward physical body will wear and eventually will die, the inner man is renewed and, and the spirit and the soul will last forever. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 says it this way, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's why as a pastor, when someone's going through the difficult times and trials and heaviness and health, and sometimes I might say, look, at, maybe you need to get some rest. Maybe you need to take some time off or readjust some things. But don't pull yourself out of the eternal workings of God. Stay a part of these things that for all of eternity, you'll be thankful you were faithful to God. It doesn't mean just keep pouring it on. I'm not the kind of pastor that someone says, boy, I'm just about to burn out and I'm so tired and I'm going to tell them, okay, we'll take another bus route and take another Sunday school class and do this. That. I recognize there's times of life for rest and Jesus came apart into a desert place and we need times to make sure that we're staying right with God. But listen, I do not apologize for challenging each and every one of us to live with eternity in mind. One day we'll see Christ. Oft times the day seems long. Life's trials seem hard to bear, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to live for eternity, to live with eternity in mind. To be a part of what God is doing here. And yes, it's a little slower during COVID, but still seeing folks saved and baptized this morning and knowing that God is still working and he's doing something in California where the rest of the nation thinks it's completely impossible. Listen, God is doing something. And we have the privilege of tithing in the midst of that and singing in the midst of that and witnessing in the midst of that. And it's a joy. And I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, we'll be glad that God put us somewhere where there's not 58 Baptist churches within a few months miles that we can make a difference for Jesus Christ. Those are the eternal things that will really matter when we see Christ. Our witness will matter. Our teaching and giving and serving will matter. I want you, if you would, to turn to one final verse and we'll be done. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. And verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now let me quickly say this word accepted is not implying that he loves you more or even in the sense of acceptance like we might say it. It's just speaking about the reception that we will have with the Lord. We're, in other words, we're laboring in this life because we're anticipating the day when he accepts us into his presence, right? We're not laboring to be accepted. We're laboring because we're accepted. But one day we will be ushered into the presence of Jesus Christ. Uh, you will be accepted there as someone that has been saved and is now welcome home. How many of you look forward to that day of acceptance? But then notice this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I do not believe that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a time where all of your bad deeds are up on a screen and where the good outweighs the bad and maybe you get into heaven. I believe that we are saved by grace and that our sins are as far as the east is from the west. So why then would we stand at the Bema Seat Judgment? I remember visiting Corinth years ago and seeing the notches in the granite where the runners would begin their race. They would run that 100-yard dash or so. They would receive that olive branch crown if they uh, won the race, and they would stand at, a, at an area that we took pictures of called the Bema Seat. It was the judge's seat 
And the racers would come and they would put their heads down and receive the crown. And I suppose if someone stumbled along the way or if someone was not disciplined to exercise, they would not receive that crown. It doesn't mean they're not a racer. It doesn't mean they weren't in the race. It doesn't mean they're kicked out of Greece as a citizen. It just means they missed a reward. And we want to so run our race, ladies and gentlemen, that this is why. It's not about some idiots on the internet. It's not about the news. It's not even about us in the flesh. This is much higher than that. We are running our race for Jesus, and we don't want to miss the opportunity to receive those rewards that in turn we can place right back at his feet. And it is bad when we miss opportunity to witness, and it is bad when we're out of shape spiritually, not because uh, we're going to see that flash up on a screen or we're going to go to hell because of it. No, but because every one of us should want to steward every moment of this life in such a way that we will be able to be rewarded at the Bema Seed judgment. And I don't know in this room how many people are living for that day like they should. It, you know, it's as if the reward in some people's mind is a certain monetary amount or a certain place. And and we dream outside of the will of God. And listen, honestly, there, there are people that they live and live and live for this little nirvana existence in their mind. You know? They can get the fishing pole right out the window, and it's going to be great, and it's going to be barbecues every night. Who in this room is living their life with this one thought? One day I'm going to stand before my Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, well, come on, Pastor, you're like preaching the Bible right now. What kind of a pastor would I be if I did not remind you that you're going to stand before him someday? That's why we have Sunday night church. Sometimes it's not easy, but it truly will be worth it all when you see Christ. You'll be glad you did not throw in the towel. You'll be glad you kept those decisions from men and boys camp out. You'll be glad you kept those decisions from revival meeting. I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm not saying you have the same stamina at 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. But with whatever stamina you got, I want to encourage you. Be faithful, my friends. Be faithful. I don't know how it's going to go. I really don't. I, 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 I know we're going to see each other. I know we're going to know each other. But I sometimes think in my mind, first of all, I think about the rapture. And I just always think, you know, it's going to be just, you know, twinkling of an eye. But sometimes I think, I'm going to look over and see Terry just for a quick second. <laughs> Wink at her with a twinkling of an eye. And then I wonder when we're there, and, and I pray that we hear these words, well done. And sometimes I just wonder if I'm going to look out of the corner of my eye and say, hey, bro, throw good. This is awesome. You know, hey, Brother Jones. Man, thanks for being faithful. Hey, we're here. This is, this is what we live for. This is what we built those buildings for and ran those buses for and supported those missionaries for. We didn't do it for the world. Once in a great while, once in a great while the world will say something nice about you. Someone, someone sent me the other day, the, the, the mayor said something about my part in the uh, Samaritan's Purse Hospital and all that, and, and he said something nice. Listen. I'm no hero. You know who the heroes are right now in our community? The nurses and doctors in those hospitals. But you know who's going to be blessed at the day of the great, at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ? Those who have been faithful to Jesus Christ. So friend, be faithful. Hey, visit the places you want to visit. Enjoy some places around. Take your grandkids. Have a good time. I get all that. Invest in people's lives. But don't live for that. Live for that. Live for him. There's a pastor friend of mine over in Barstow, California. Brother Dan Hampton. How many of you have ever met Dan Hampton? Any of you? So some of you remember Brother Hampton. He was a, he was a retired Marine. And I preached for him on several occasions. And Brother Hampton was truly an American patriot. He really loved this country, Vietnam veteran. 
One time we're sitting at a restaurant after church and a car went by and I'm pretty sure it was just like a backfire sound, but it was loud. Sounded somewhat like gunshot, but it was a backfire. I'll never forget that man at that time in his 60s. He jumped under that table where we were eating. And, he, and when he came back out, he was trembling, trembling. He had tears in his eyes. He said, I'm sorry, Brother Chapel." He said, ever since Vietnam, it's just that's what I do. He was such a precious man, such a faithful soul winner. And uh, sometimes spoke with a little bit of a list, but it was just his personality. He knocked, he told me, he said, Brother Chapel, I've knocked on every door in Barstow seven times trying to tell people about Jesus. I know it's dusty, but it was his Jerusalem. He ran buses, he loved those buses. And he, he, he'd bring up the kids. This is, this is so-and-so. She's on from bus two. And he loved the bus ministry. And he had a decent military retirement. His wife had a civil service retirement. He didn't have to be in the ministry. But he knew that one day he was going to see Jesus Christ face to face. He certainly didn't have to be in Barstow. But God called him to Barstow. And so, for some 30 years, he walked those dusty streets in Barstow. Until last week with COVID, God called him home. And I have no doubt in my mind when that soldier got to heaven and saw Jesus Christ, I have no doubt in my mind he was singing that song, It's Worth It All to see Christ. Oh, COVID gets people down and gets people moody and gets people distracted and the devil's got those lures. Hey, you know, you're out of church a little bit. Why don't you come all the way out? And the devil's going to keep those lures coming. But I want to encourage you that this life is but a vapor. Let's be faithful to the one who has saved us. Tonight we're going to have an altar call, but the altar is going to be your seat. We're going to stand in a moment, and I'm going to ask you if God is convicting you about misplaced love, that you would kneel at your seat and take some time to pray that God would help you as we approach our revival. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I pray that you would help us to realize we can't love the world and love you at the same time. To help us to realize the temptations are there and to flee those temptations and help us to live for that day when we'll see you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to ask our pianist just to pr play and I'm going to ask you to pray now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or this or that. Would you just kneel at your seat there and find an altar? Make an altar. Get out in the aisle if you want. You're smart enough to socially distance. We don't, we don't need a, a memo from Sacramento to figure out how to pray. Just pray. Some of you have been living in your mind for where you're going to go. That's all you think about. And, and people tell me, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Would you live for something higher? of you that are online, would you pray with us? Would you pray that love for Christ would be the preeminent factor in your life?
Father, thank you for your patience with us. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking and dreaming and planning and involving ourselves in this world so deeply. Forgive us for chasing the lures of Satan. Help us to keep our eyes upon you until that great day when you call us to the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would use the upcoming week of awakening to continue that work within us, to prepare us to be a people centered around Christ and his gospel as we enter these last days. For these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a challenging scripture tonight to have the right love. And I pray that you'll maybe take some time this week and read this again and pray. And in your, in your time of prayer and fasting, go over these messages and seek God's help for this upcoming week of awakening. Well, I want to remind you that if you're here with us as a guest and you do not know Christ as your Savior, I'm going to be out in the West Wing there, and I'd love to speak to you. Some of our pastoral staff may be right up here at the front. If, if any of our church family has a need for counseling or prayer or you want to get involved somehow in serving the Lord, we're here. We're trying to respect the distance but still be available. And I want you to pray for our, 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 care, our caregivers and nurses and doctors. Pray for their safety. Uh, pray for uh, those that are afflicted right now, Brother Ken's father, another man in our church, really battling COVID. Just pray for these. And would you also pray that uh, with so many people having now had the virus and now getting the vaccine, pray that we'll see some normal ministry coming on real soon. That's what I'm praying for and looking for. And I want you to pray with me toward that end. I'm going to ask Brother Obero if you'd please come. If I could ask you to come and pray for us tonight, Brother Obero. Uh, Brother Obero pastored for many years down in San Diego. And how many years, Brother Obero? 33 years he pastored. Come right on up here. And I, were you in the Navy before that, Brother Obero? Do I remember, remember that? 11 years and had a lot of military in his church. And he's uh, retired recently. And uh, by arrangement with his deacons in church, his, his membership is still there. And I understand that after 33 years. But uh, he's with us so often now as a uh, part of our church family. Of course, his daughter teaches in our school. And uh, Brother Obero, it's just good to see you over there tonight. I just sense, I love having men like Brother Obero and Brother Gary Williams, these retired pastors, because I know they're praying for me while I preach. And, uh, and I appreciate that. But I'd like you to pray for us as we're dismissed and just ask the Lord to help us to live what we learned and, uh, and pray for our upcoming revival, if you would. And then as he prays, we'll be dismissed. And don't forget, if you haven't signed up for the Home Fellowship in February, do that out back. You can get your pen, get your calendar if you didn't get it. And we'll look forward to a great uh, midweek Bible study time and then a great revival this coming week. Let's pray together. Shall we pray? Again, our loving Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house of prayer and worship tonight. Thank you for the man of God who preached your word. Help us now, Lord, not only to be hearers, but be doers. Prepare our hearts for this coming awakening revival with Dr. Getz. Lord, I pray that you would empower him. And thank you for this church family who can hear thy word preach. And thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray for the desire again of Dr. Chapel that one day become normal, back to normal as we worship you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.